Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you already know that my HP 9825, famously used by Mr. Fancy Pants in the HP catalog, recently died from a power supply failure that caused an overvoltage. The 5 volts temporarily became 13 volts, which is a big ouchie if you are a TTL chip. In episode 4, we learned that there are two RAM boards on the 9825T. The bottom one, codenamed Ebenezer, the only one present in the 9825B, contains 32K of RAM and also all of the operating system code in ROM. The top one, codenamed Skull, is only available on our top of the line HP 9825T model and provides an additional 32K, bringing the total memory to a welcome 64K. In the previous episode, we defeated the Evil Noodle Logic and repaired the Ebenezer board. It had 5 bad chips, 3 Garden Variety TTL, 1 Option ROM and an Intel DRAM controller, for which we built a fancy tester. Although we did not get to replace the Option ROM yet, replacing the TTLs and the Intel chip was enough to allow the 9825 to boot in a B configuration. Yay, the HP 9825 is back with us. It works. But as soon as we add our scroll board to put the machine in its original T configuration, the and computer you know. again fails to boot. So the scroll board is obviously faulty. We'll try to repair it in this episode. Looking at the scroll board schematics, we can see that the 32K of expansion RAM is implemented the same way as in the Ebenezer board we just repaired, with 16K DRAM chips. There's also an exact copy of the Noodle refresh logic, which we understand fairly well by now. Finally, it has a whole new section, the mysterious scroll logic, which magically doubles the addressable memory space by overlapping RAM and ROM address spaces. We'll get into that later, but I first want to check if the RAM section works, as I suspect that the Intel controller is likely faulty as it was on the Ebenezer board. So we, we are going to move on to the A25 board and we know or so strongly suspect that the uh, scroll mechanism which decides if an access is ROM or RAM is not working because when you put that board it disables the ROM. Uh, but it also has 32K of RAM and it's the same logic as the other board. So I'm going to check RAM here and see if I have refreshes. I, I suspect that my Intel chip is dead no matter what. So I'm just trying to catch a refresh cycle. Run, see if it counts. Okay, and it doesn't boot as expected. Stop. And so it, it has not started yet, but definitely I have no RAM address. So it starts eventually, and uh, I see no RAM refresh addresses and I, I see refresh cycles because I'm triggering on them and I, I see jumping around so it's trying and then it gets lost so definitely memory is not working and I su suspect Intel chips not working uh, okay which is going to complicate how we test uh, the yeah. first bug is that it's disabling ROM so we should be able to get past that yeah, yeah, because it starts, right? It's trying, okay. We'll let the bad RAM live because for now we're not concerned about it, uh, but it's still masking the ROM and we know it's because it's disabling it. And it's at the end of the logic. The problem solved by the scroll logic is that the processor could only address 64K of total memory. And this was already maxed out in the B with the ROM and the RAM each taking approximately half of that. But the scroll board adds another 32K of RAM, which does not fit into the address space. To make this work, it introduces a crazy logic hack that puts ROM and RAM on top of each other in the address space. It then allows to use 64K of either RAM or ROM by disabling the other one on the fly. The logic starts on the left by connecting to the monitor bus a bus previously used only during development and manufacturing for test and debug. The logic monitors everything the processor is doing via this bus, and after much complication, 
comes up with the answer in the form of a single line called ROM disable. That's the one that disables either RAM or ROM on the fly so they can coexist in the address space. But our scroll logic is dead and the ROM disable is stuck permanently on. This is why adding our scroll board kills our resurrected machine. It prevents the processor to access ROM as soon as we plug it in. But how does the scroll logic work? Luckily, this summary document survived, written by Richard Harrington and Rick Dow. Rick Dow's name also appears at the bottom of the schematics we are using. And in this period picture of the 1925T development group, Rick is the young fellow with the blue DCD shirt. And in this Zoom conference from last week, he is the very man in the picture. I am indebted to the person that put us in touch, Steve Lipson, here with me in the lab, also a former engineer of the 1925 and the author of the hp1925.com site dedicated to the history of that machine. And he also joined us in the Zoom. As I was explaining before you joined, my, my goal here is to try to connect the machine to the people. It's very powerful when we actually meet the original engineers and, and, and are able to do that. Well, I think your videos are terrific, Dan. So I congratulate you and urge you to do more. Well, th thank you. Uh, Rick, you stayed at HP for your, actually, your whole career? Yes, I, I left HP in 2012. So I worked there um, for like 33 years. I stayed in, in Fort Collins, Colorado uh, until 1990. Um, and I worked on different things at HP and Fort Collins. Uh, and I, I sort of switched to, uh, to writing software uh, after this. So I didn't do many more hardware projects. So you're, you're over here, right, uh, Rick? That's me, Rick, when I was 21. And the, the person right in front of me is, is Bob Tinnan. He's wearing the sort of peach-colored shirt and the plaid pants. And he was our boss. And, and as I said, he designed the, uh, the RAM, the 16K, the RAM circuitry that used the 16K chips. Okay. Go and in front, in front of Bob Tinnan in the uh, jeans and the blue shirt and the mustache, that's Richard, mm -hmm. the uh, technical uh, lead, the, the, the architect of the project. Well, anyway, uh, I had not seen the, the Skull product reference specification for more than 40 years myself. I want to give credit to, uh, to Richard, the, the other author of the Skull document, and he was really the primary author of that. And, and by the way, Skull, where, where, what does, where does that come from? What does that refer to? Well, it's, it's named after the, the chewing tobacco. I don't know why, but I, I had a can of Skull chewing tobacco outside of my cubicle and we were working on that project. So how did that come to be the, the Skull project, uh, or, which you know, looks like the hack of the century? Right, it is the, the hack of the century, that's, that's fair to say. So again, uh, my colleague Richard was probably the, the lead designer of that. He, you know, he had been uh, monitoring the bus activity on a 9825A and had gotten through all of it. And, and he really had the, the high level design by the time I started on it. So my job was mainly to, you know, implement the low level circuitry and merge a, a RAM board that my boss, uh, who unfortunately has just passed away recently, his name was Bob Tinnan. He had done a RAM board and I, incorporated his circuitry and, and made the skull board. Well, I can see a, a 1925 that looks exactly like mine on the bench right now. <laughs> uh -huh. I also can see a logic analyzer 1601, I think. I think that's what mainly Richard used to, to watch all of the uh, cycles on the memory bus and, and to develop those design rules that were documented in the Skull document. Oh my, they used this HP 1600A logic analyzer, one of the very first ones. I have the 1607, which is the same thing without the integrated screen, and all it can capture and display is 16 states of 16 bits, for a grand total of 256 bits of memory. 
and it can only display them in glorious ones and zeros on a scope screen. Right, he executed everything, and that's that's how we discovered things like there was code that was writing to ROM, and you know, due to bugs and stuff like that. Uh, so, Rick, you will recognize another yes. document. <laughs> so, somebody comes out with the brilliant idea to put RAM over ROM in the same address space, right? And that's the score. Yes. You are going to figure out on the fly if an instruction wants, when it fetches something into memory, if it intends to fetch from ROM or from RAM. Yes. Which looks magical and impossible. So the main reason that it works is that the, the firmware or software for that product was, was mature uh, and it was in ROM. So we knew that it, it wasn't going to change very much. So, you know, we could just analyze the behavior of that software in detail and look at, you know, every single instruction and see how it behaved. And you, and you will see down at the bottom of the rules, there's a, a bitmap. So we, we had a small ROM on the school board with one bit for every instruction in the entire ROM, um, you know, to suggest uh, whether, whether the memory, the data accessed by that instruction should go to RAM or ROM. So because, because the uh, software was, was so stable, we, we could analyze it in detail. And, and also because it was so small, you know, we were looking at less than 65K of code altogether. It was, it was sort of possible for a human being to, to analyze that and, and understand it, un, unlike today's software, which is mm -hmm. gigabytes. Nobody could ever understand it in detail. So, so Richard studied it, I, again, I think with that primitive logic analyzer, Actually, Rick later confirmed with Richard that he analyzed it with the help of another related machine, the HP9835, which was the remote debug machine hooked to the monitor port during development and test. That makes much more sense. That poor 1600 logic analyzer would have been totally overwhelmed by the task. And came up with these rules. And the, you can see the first few rules are... are kind of intuitive or straightforward. And then the last rules at the bottom are very narrowly focused and, and only make sense in the, in the context of that specific set of uh, assembly code. So that's what the school logic does. It looks at what the processor is doing and implements a set of nine rules to decide if the code actually intended to access ROM or RAM. Rule 1 is easy, if it writes something, it's got to be in RAM. Same for Rule 2, which is direct memory access for the I.O. cards. The ROM code does not fill the entire 64K, so the area above 60,000 is always RAM, which is Rule 3. Rule 4 has to do with the base page, which contains all the long jumps and has to be always accessible, so they simply didn't put any RAM there. Rule 5 is why this thing actually works. The machine almost never executes binary code from the user, because HPL is an interpreted language, just like BASIC. So if the processor is fetching an instruction, it has to be from the ROM firmware, not from any of the user code. Rule 6 is an arcane rule for the interpreter tokenizer. Rule 7 is a specific exception for the flexible diskette option, which was too big to fit in ROM, so they stuck some binary code loaded in stolen RAM, this is one of the rare cases where instructions can actually be executed from RAM. Rule 8 is another special corner case, and Rule 9, finally, is the brute force approach, looking up the extra ROM on the scroll board, which contain a bit for every single line of the ROM code, telling if the programmer intended to use RAM or ROM. There were still rare occasions when HP or an OEM would ship RAM-based binaries with some of their products, like the 9825 diagnostic tape, for example, which, by the way, nobody has a copy of anymore. If the binaries were small enough, you could execute them under Rule 1 from above address 60,000. But if all else failed, they had you covered. The school board decoded five new assembly instructions, which were formerly no-ops for the processor. 
This allowed future unanticipated binaries to be written at the cost of manually telling Skull what to do. Phew, is that a hack or what? I implemented the logic to make that happen and it worked. This is an early prototype of the Skull board. One, it's Rev A1. Pull and you can see on the back, um, I, I think there were, there were a lot of changes that needed to be made to this early prototype version A1. In fact, it probably went to maybe A3 or something. Okay, three so versions. And then once we certified that A3 was good, they took the three off and called it Rev A. Mm -hmm. What was the circuit board done in HP? I think it was done in HP. I think yeah, they. Loveland had a PC board shop. Yeah, in the basement. My wife worked there. Ah. <laughs> All right, so we'll let the bad RAM live because for now we're not concerned about it, uh, but it's still masking the ROM and we know it's because it's disabling it. And it's at the end of the logic. So r right over here is the ROM disable signal comes into that gate and there are all the conditions for, for that to happen. And somehow one of these gates that was to in all these input bits stuck to one, which would disable the ROM. And we just figured out it was this one over here. And this one goes all to the way to the skull bit, which leads into the skull ROM. Right, it comes out from over here. Uh, but I'm already set up to look at ROM, so maybe I'll look at the scroll ROM and see if it gets its bit out. So here's my ROM, this one has a sticker on it. I'll just move the probe that we use to debug ROM. Oops, over here too. Ah, there's a cap in the way. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so I'm now instrumented on the ROM. On the scroll bit and see if it fetches any of the bits. Okay, that's what I got. Yeah, goes 41, 42, 42, 44. So the scroll ROM is getting its address. So all the scroll bits are one. It's not 377 all the time, it's 376, 375. So it has one scroll bit here, two scroll bits there. Um, then there's no school bits, then 355, plenty of them. Hmm. Instruction 40 should be a ROM access, right? right? Instruction 40, 376, yeah, first bit is call, right? Yep. So the starch reads 040, 376 comes out, so the school bit comes out and it's not making it through. Okay, so there might be a way to debug that. But while we are worrying about the school bits, Ken has matched the rules with the schematics and has figured out that maybe we are not worrying about the right thing at all. Yeah, Ken has figured it out again. Maybe. Go ahead. So. so so, you have these nine rules that decide whether you're doing RAM or ROM. And what this gate does is decides if you should use, if you should enable the later rules. If this is one, then these gates for the later rules are enabled. If it's zero, these ones are disabled. So this this one here is looking at whether you're doing a write. So that's the first rule. Yeah, so the write cannot happen in ROM, for Th sure. This one here is looking at if it's zero through 1777. So that's handling rule four. And then these ones are handling you know, rules six through nine. So rule four, yeah, oh, so that's so, the one so, that so we would like to, this, this means you're, you're booting. Right, so rule, rule, four, rule four is the one that should be active saying that we're booting from ROM. Yes. Uh, but because you're seeing um, pin five enabled, it's triggering off one of the later rules. Which it shouldn't. Which it shouldn't, because it should have decided by this point at the higher priority rule that you're booting from ROM. Yes. So the problem is that the pin five is active here, yes. which is meaning we're going to RAM because of one of these rules that we shouldn't even be looking at. Right. So. And that's decided by the gate before. Yeah. So this this one is basically deciding should we look at rules six through nine or should we ignore them? 
And because we're booting from address 40, we should be having a one come in here, a one going into the NOR gate and a zero coming out. Yeah. But we're getting a one out. So that's where things are breaking down. Okay. So after Ken's input, I move to uh, check that this input is right. So right now we're doing a very simple experiment monitoring if the zero to one seven seven seven, which is the beginning of, oh, actually, no, it stays there very, very short time because it's, it moves to 10,000. So we might not catch uh, the, the glitch, but anyhow, this should come on very early in the boot and then should make it this way, should make it to out of the gate, right? Well, that didn't work at all. A bit on the glitch. There we go. So it should have come up right here. Right at the beginning, it didn't. Well, wait, is, is green the zero to one seven seven seven? Yes. And it is high. Oh, it is high. It's doing it. It's doing the right thing. Yeah. And it's, so the output is low for a while. Yeah. Um, so, which is what we wanted to see, right? So we really need to move to U59 now that we've got a good uh, trigger point. Yeah. So it looks like it's decoding this early address correctly. It's making it through the gate. And let's see if it prevents from disabling the room. If it ROM, if it makes it, makes it to the end of this next gate, which is address 8. So now my blue is now move one step down and it should be at zero at the beginning of the boot, right? It should, no, it should not dis disable, it should be at one. The wrong disable should be on, it should be on. So this one should be, and then start to wiggle. Try it. So it's not on. It's not making it out. Look at that ridiculous signal here. So okay, no, so that gate doesn't work. Well, something else, one of the other AND gates could be holding it low. So we checked all the input to that thing and it should not tie that thing down, uh, which is our ROM disable. So I'm back probing the ROM disable on blue. And I think the output of the gate is either pull low or something happens. That's not a valid signal here. Right, it's something's cheesy. So I could either remove the inverter that's loading it or the problem is the inverter is probably multiple inverters up the whole screen. Right. Right, 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 right. Uh, so it's easier to pull U59 than Chester. Right. Well, we pull both right there. So the output of this gate is not working, so either it's shorted by something, or it's not working on its own. I might guess that it's shorted by the SO4, which is one of the circuit that blue. Do you have any bets? Or do you agree see. with me? We'll see. All right. So I'm trying to figure out where that is. So we think we have pinpointed the, the bad net. The ROM disable line is always low, despite the inputs to U59 being correct. It could be that U59 is bad. It could also be that one of the two gates that are attached to the net, the SO2 and the SO4, are bad and holding it low. Which one is it? Maybe we give the HP547 probe that we tried to use in episode 6. A second chance because we we hadn't read the uh, the manual and it turns out the, the probe one is we didn't realize there's a little ground here although we should because of course it has to go somewhere it's pretty tiny so it seems to work better this time if I get here that's my signal out of the gate and then I seem to lose it right when I lose it I lose it right around here it's pretty sensitive right here 
And here there is a via, so it's shorted over here. And uh, it would be on pin 9 of the circuit, but no current goes there. But it keeps going and it goes on pin, where is that? I lost it. U25 pin 12. Oh yeah, it's definitely that's where it goes. It's over here. So according to the probe, if this circuit is good, then it's shorted by this one and not this one. So if we believe the HP probe, this gate, a 74S02 NOR gate, is shorting the net. So I just soldered the two chips, the Intel chip uh, for the RAM refresh, same as and the, the other board, and the suspect chip uh, that the HP probes told us might not be good. And here's the Intel one. And it's like it's like the one the other board is totally dead 77 77 if it's in row it's in column no reaction no reaction no refresh so exact same same death as the other one it's dead jim how is your chip doing uh professor ken two low inputs and the led lights up so that that part works now if we move to the to the fourth one so you have one gate that works as advertised? Mm -hmm. Three gates work. Yeah, three gates that work. And then this one, we put in two low inputs and we get nothing. So this this one is clearly... And, that, and that's the gate that was incriminated by our HP Pro? Right. Then we also measured the input voltages and they're getting pulled lower than the other inputs. Okay, so... so that, that, that gate that seems to be bad. Okay, so I think the HP Pro worked. Dang, yeah. wow, interesting. Okay, so we can actually run the board without, if I have another one of the, isn't it SO2? SO2. Uh, w we can change that and it should be able to run without the Intel chip. We just won't get any RAM, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so same thing again. So we're trying to see if we have recovered the blue trace, basically, right? It should be single action. Of course, it went on who knows what. Nope. Come on. There you go. Yeah. It's a different it's result. It's a different it's a different result. It's still, still not bad. still not boot. We still don't get 13 and 12. That should pulse at the output. Well, something else is holding you. Yeah, we have more than... And well, it should be low, right? And look at that. This is, this is good. This oh. is not good. Pin 13. So that should be 2,000 to 3777. Look at that. That, yeah, is, was that, that is not correct. Okay. Um, Do you have blue on pin 8? I have blue on pin 8. Uh, get more chips off. You want to test that chip and the and the, the SO4. Mm -hmm. Dang! It looks like we may have more than one chip that might be bad on our net. So I go ahead and remove the green chip, an N or invert chip, and the blue gate, which is part of a 74 SO4 hex inverter. So what what does it say, Master Ken? So we're not getting any output out of the AND or invert. Um, we've grounded all the AND gates, so the AND gate should give zero zeros into the NOR gate. We should be getting a one out, but the LED is not lighting up. Uh, if we hook it up to power, you yeah. can see it lights up. If we hook it up to the pin 8 output, we're getting nothing. Okay, AND OR ANVERT. So that one is bad, and then we have yet another one, which is the uh, the little LSO4. This, this chip is a 74 LS04. It's uh. supposed to be a hex inverter, uh -huh. um, but after testing, it's a penta inverter. So, and the one that that is bad is the one that's also in the same network. Yes. So all three chips were bad on that network. This is a good one. Yeah, this is definitely. Here, here's another good one. Here's the bad one. And that's exactly the one that was hooked up to our chip. So the the. the Whole chips destroyed each other. Everything on that, as Carl said, everything on that one net just died. I have the 0691, so I have the uh, 4232 and or invert. 
and I need to find a 6A3 and I think I have it 6A3 right there hex inverter if you can focus it's all it's so weird that all those three chips died they're all connected together it's the one net the yeah one one. Uh, from the other board maybe so I well, that, I don't know that they got the jolt that's for sure mm -hmm. it, the Intel we know doesn't work at 13 volts it just doesn't like it okay so replace all the bad TTL we can find on that net aha I get an output out of um, you do yeah out, out of the blue one but it's, that's only when it's disabling it it doesn't boot though well, that's because you're on every ram right we don't know we oh it's much better Whew. okay well that's nice all right we got that we got that so um let's take a let's let's hook it up on the yeah. logic analyzer run oh yeah it's trying to boot it's doing the code so it, it unlocked the uh, the rom for sure so it's it's definitely we repaired the uh, rom masking so now it's reading the rom it's going there and I have scroll bits of O and 1 from time to time so that all works uh, and then so I have we have to find where it where it loses it uh, I, I suppose it gets entangled in the RAM indeed somewhere all right now they look new I think they are fine I can they're just totally brand new it's in you have bets I bet it works so I think it's new 46 yep that's correct 34 yeah 34 36 yeah that's row as here it's indicated here that's column so row 44 54 follows it column 45 43 okay that works too and then count is this button count no it's not that button no, that, that one that button oh thank you 72 uh, yeah and yeah it's all working okay well that's a totally working chip we can solder it in um, so I think the problem is going to be that it's still not going to boot uh, because it doesn't have the ROM. Yes, that one feature ROM. Yeah, but we, we we can we can try. Which ROM is that? The the, the one of the ROM died. It's an option ROM. And it's an option ROM that does the tape. Okay. Yeah, so what you would see is on the clock. When Chip soldered. Guys, right, I'm going to make a, a quick try here, see if it boots with the uh, Intel chip replaced. My guess is no, but we'll see. It did! Okay. Alright, so we have the uh, Ebenezer, no, this Ebenezer and the scrollboard repaired. Uh, actually, we don't have uh, all the functionality because we're missing the ROM uh, so let's burn the ROM and then it's on to keyboard and then it's on to tape keyboard and tape all right so it was uh, how many chips did we get uh, we got three four bad chips so on one board five bad chips on the other board four bad chips means so, there's so. one there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> we've missed one <laughs> Yeah, your skull board works again. We fixed it. <laughs> wow. Good. So. I'm, I'm glad. Again, I'm very impressed with your, your troubleshooting uh, process. Uh, very impressive. Yeah, but no, we, we were just glorified technicians. There's, there's this a huge gap between repairing things that others have done, right? Uh -huh. And then you know, coming up with the stuff in the first place. But 
Well, I will say that, w- that my early career at HP it was just a really fun, wonderful place to work. Uh, it was just fun. We were doing fun things. We, we had small groups who worked together. We really had a great sense of accomplishment. We had fun together. We socialized together. Um, great people. Uh, and, and, you know, for many years, it was really a, 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 just a fun place, a rewarding place to work. For most of us, that was our first job out of school was this mm-hmm. HP job. And we're immensely proud of what we were able to accomplish as they say on Star Trek, with stone knives and bearskin. Well, you better be proud, and we'll keep on trying to preserve your engineering legacy. See you in the next episode. So, Mark, did you get the keyboard running? N- uh, that, that will be the next step, right? To get uh, so the. It's got a KDP chip on it. That's a custom ASIC for the yeah. keyboard and display and printer. So that this one, I'm really worried about. <laughs>